I am a truck driver, and this is by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. I pulled into a rest area off the highway in the middle of nowhere one night at around 3.30 in the morning. The place was completely deserted. Not a single truck or vehicle of any kind anywhere. As soon as I parked my truck, I reclined my seat and fell asleep. It wasn't alarming at first, but I could faintly hear the sound of a dog growling somewhere outside. I started to wake up, however, as the sound of the growling was getting louder and louder. It sounded like a dog was walking towards my truck, growling. Then all of a sudden, the growling stopped, and I thought for a moment that I could get some much needed rest. But then abruptly, the growling started up again, and it was right outside my driver's side window. I opened my eyes and looked out. There was a crazy looking man with his face up against my window, growling at me. He looked totally insane. I started my engine and drove the hell out of there. I was upstairs playing video games when I heard a dog whimper from the kitchen area, which is right at the bottom of the stairs. I figure that it's my dog having to go out, so I call her and ask if she does. But she just runs upstairs. She looks as though as someone just scolded her, but she's a timid dog, so I thought nothing of it. Five minutes later, I'm finishing up the game and about to let her out when I hear the same dog whimper but my dog is right next to me. I'm a little weirded out, and then it happens again, followed by what I can only describe as a meager attempt of a human imitating a dog whimpering. Now I'm flipping out. I'm not sure if there's an intruder or what. Trying to be rational, I'm thinking maybe my uncle came with his dog to check on me, and they're just playing downstairs. While all these thoughts are going through my head, the whimpers continue. The dog goes, and then the human, just back and forth. All of this takes place over maybe 30 seconds. I finally grow a pair and start to approach the top of the stairs as quietly as possible. My dog has also gotten up at this point and looks scared. But as I got to the stairs, the noise gets quieter. I hear one last muffled human whimper, except this time, it sounds like it's upstairs, in a corner. I nearly had a heart attack, and I kept a knife on me the rest of the week. Worst yet, over the past month, my dog has gone missing four times. And I'm talking like my mom alerted the neighbors and did a full search through the house, inside and out not finding her for hours and then suddenly we hear her crying from a closet upstairs she somehow locked herself in it's the first place we check now and even then there's been a time where she's missing the closet is open so we continue the search and then 10 minutes later we find her locked in that closet When I was younger, I spent the day helping a neighbor rake leaves on his property. He was friendly with my family, so he walked me home to say hi to my parents. We walked into the house and heard my mom upstairs talking. It sounded like she was on the phone and walking around. I called for my dad. No answer. My neighbor says, Well, it sounds like your mom is on the phone, so I'll catch them another time. We say goodbye and he leaves. I go upstairs to see my mom, but she's nowhere to be seen, and she's no longer talking. I search the house and it's completely empty. I'm thinking, did she leave the house while I was saying goodbye to the neighbor somehow? I call my dad's cell phone, because my mom didn't have one at the time, and he picks right up. 
I ask him where he is and if he knows where mom went. He responds, We're at the grocery store. We've been running errands for a couple of hours. Instant goosebumps. My neighbor and I both heard footsteps upstairs and a woman's voice. No idea who it was, but we both heard it. I waited outside until my parents got home. When I was a kid, I had no curtains or blinds over my window in my room. There's a street lamp just outside my window, so anything that walks past my window would cast a shadow on my wall. Two nights in a row, I woke up and looked at the wall to see the shadow of a man. I didn't have enough courage to turn and look up at the window to see who it was. It was late at night, too. I knew it couldn't be my dad because I could hear him snoring. The worst part is my bed was in front of the window with my head at the bottom of the window, so whoever it was behind me could probably see me. This is the scariest thing that's happened to me because it's not something supernatural. There's a good chance there was a man just standing at my window in the middle of the night watching me sleep. My apartment was robbed once and broken into again a couple months later. The scary part? I had just moved in when I got very, very ill. I had to go stay with my parents while getting treatment at the hospital. No one had been to my new place or knew the address. It was full of unpacked boxes as I was too ill to move in properly. They left the TV. They left the jar of cash on the dresser. They only took my diaries. Multiple diaries. I always buy the same kind, and they date back for years. They were packed in different boxes, too. Someone had rifled through my stuff, found the diaries, and took only those. They even left my recipe books, which are the same style as the diaries, so they had to have checked. My apartment was on the third floor. There was no sign of a break-in, but there was small handles on the outside of the pillars on the porch that went all the way to the ground. Maybe they climbed? The second time, I returned home one night to find the light outside of my door was off. I didn't think much of it, except that I would need to call to get it replaced. I unlocked and opened the door and tried to turn on the light. Nothing. I thought maybe the power had gone out, but then I looked over and saw my microwave with the correct time on it. Something about that scared me, and I went to wait in my car after I called the apartment complex on-call agent. He came over, and I waited outside. He eventually came out of my apartment and told me to call the cops. Turns out, nothing had been taken, but every light bulb in my apartment had been unscrewed just enough so that the lights would not turn on. The cops came and checked it out, found nothing suspicious, but told me to stay somewhere else for the night. The next day, after telling my sister what happened, she and her boyfriend drove in from three hours away and installed deadbolts. This was totally against the complex's policy, but the management was just as creeped out as I was. Nothing else creepy happened in the two years that I lived there. But I'm positive that somebody was there. Somebody broke into my apartment more than once. My older sister and I shared a bedroom since there was a time period when her and I couldn't sleep either due to horrible nightmares or noises in the night. Her and I started sleeping in the same bed. I had a queen size bed and she had a twin. We both slept in my bed because we were scared to sleep alone. My bed was pushed up against the wall and this wall was connected to our garage. One night, my sister shakes me to wake up 
and says to me, Do you hear that? I sat up groggily and stayed silent. Then I heard a bang, like someone with a closed fist hitting the other side of the wall of where my bed was pressed up against. A few seconds later, another bang, coming from a different part of the wall. I sat there in disbelief. Our door was opened and you could see across the hall into our parents' room, and their door was shut. Then another bang. So finally my sister made a fist and started punching the wall back. As we sat there in silence, my cell phone started to ring. Who the hell is calling me at this hour, I thought. So I crawl over to where my phone was on the floor. It was plugged in and charging, and I see my sister's cell phone on the display screen. I turn around and look at my sister and say, Your cell phone is calling me. Her phone was charging right next to mine on the floor, and she had one of those flip phones that back in the day you had to literally open up to dial out. Her closed phone somehow managed to call my phone. She looked at me and said, What? When she checked her phone, on the outgoing calls was my number. We hauled ass out of our room. It was just very creepy how it all seemed to have happened at the exact same time. We never did figure out what was banging on the wall. When I was in my teens, my parents took a vacation, but left their cars in the driveway. It was just my grandmother who lived in our house, my younger sister and myself, for almost two weeks. One random night, I woke up to our dog growling and the motion sensor lights in our backyard turning on. I got up and walked towards the front of the house and noticed a shadow coming through the bottom of the door crack. Somebody was standing there. I slowly crept my way to the peephole, and when I looked out, I saw an eyeball looking in. I froze for a second in a panic, and then rushed to the phone to call 911. As I was running away from the door, the person did one really loud slam on the front door, and gave off a laugh that was very similar to the Joker. As I'm calling the police, I run to one of the windows to see if I can see what the person looks like, and I notice a very old car speeding off down the street. I never knew who it was or why they were there. The police believed it was probably a burglar, thinking nobody had been in the house because the cars hadn't moved in days. I live in a loft in a downtown area next to a few bars. The entrance to the building is a street-side unmarked door, randomly placed between businesses. It usually goes unnoticed. It opens directly to a staircase leading to the three apartments here. It's been a constant fear that drunk people from the bars mistakenly make their way into my foyer. Back in October, I had the shock of a lifetime. It was about 3 a.m. on a work night, and I woke up hearing two very distinct voices coming from my living room area. I have two friends who have keys to my place in case they are at the bar and need to sleep it off, but neither voice sounds like them. Then I heard what sounded like eerie violin. I thought two drunk people had broken into my apartment and I guess decided to watch a movie or something. I was freaking out and trying to figure it all out. I just hid and hoped that it would go away. Finally, the sounds just completely disappeared, which was just as disheartening. I didn't hear any footsteps, so it made me think they grew aware of my presence. I grabbed a weapon I keep next to my bed and slowly creeped toward the living room. Nothing was there. It was pitch black, and everything was turned off. As it turns out, my neighbor, who owns the film studio I live above, 
pulled an all-nighter editing his entry to the Halloween horror film contest that he hosts every year. He was reviewing his film and accidentally paired with my soundbar instead of his own. He played the audio very loudly to a horror film to me in my pitch black apartment at three o'clock in the morning. I worked on a cruise ship for seven months as a youth staff, taking care of kids while the parents partied up. At certain parts of the day, we closed the playroom to the older kids and just let parents with their children that are under two come in. One day, this woman comes to the gate with a double stroller with two of the most unusual looking babies I've ever seen in my life. She asks if she can come in with her babies. Of course I oblige, but something seems a little off. She takes the babies out of the stroller and puts them on the blanket that we have toys placed upon the middle of the room. It is then that I realize what was so strange about these babies. They were dolls. This woman was taking pictures of them with the toys and pretending they were alive with names and everything. I just looked over at my coworker and she's giving me the same look of shock and horror that I had on my face. We had no clue what to do or what to say. News spread quickly to other crew members on the ship about her. Apparently, she bought gold bracelets for them at the jewelry shop on board. That woman is by far the most amazing and scariest person I have ever met at sea. When I was a teenager, there was an abandoned mental hospital a few towns over. My friends and I used to go explore it, and one evening, we were walking around and it was very dark. We hear something, shine our flashlights to the left, and there is a man walking down the hall in the dark, with no flashlight. He doesn't say anything, doesn't make eye contact, nothing just keeps walking straight towards us. We keep our flashlights on him until he turns the corner. We didn't say a word to each other and didn't stop running until we got back outside. Once we were out, we stopped to catch our breath and discuss it. All three of us saw him. It wasn't our imagination. But of course, no one has believed any of us when we told the story. I was up late, like around 11 p.m., because my two-year-old had a high fever. I was holding her in my lap as she slept while sitting downstairs on the couch. I was watching TV, but wasn't really paying attention when something moved out of the corner of my eye. Across from the couch are two double doors with floor-to-ceiling windows. The shades were open, and I could see out onto the back deck. Well... Something was hanging off the screen door that opened outwards towards the deck. It was swinging back and forth and was staring at me. It looked like a tiny man, but the head was scrunched down like it was fused with its shoulders. I couldn't really see the face, but it seemed like it was grinning at me. I just sat there frozen in fear and watched this thing swing back and forth, back and forth. I finally got up the courage to gather my daughter in my arms and sprint away from the family room and up the stairs to my bedroom where I called my parents. They didn't live far and my dad came over with a shotgun and walked around the perimeter of the house. He didn't find anything, not even footprints. I know what I saw. I was wide awake. I still get freaked out when I lay on the couch late at night so I always close the blinds and lock the door. So there was one night I was sitting in my living room around 1 a.m., just watching TV and playing on my phone and so on. From the couch in my living room, 
I could see through the dining room and out into the back garden. I'm watching TV and notice a slight flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye, so I quickly focus my attention to the dining room. That's when I see some guy just standing at my dining room window, staring at me. I bolted upstairs faster than I ever moved before and grabbed the metal bar that was off of a set of dumbbells. I wait for what feels like an eternity and then decide to go into the front bedroom, opposite side of the house where I saw the guy, and I peek out the window to see him casually strolling down the street. I didn't sleep that night. Before my parents decided to switch rooms with me, I was sleeping in the back room, which is a converted porch with its own door to the backyard, and windows on two sides of the room that reach from the floor to the ceiling. I would hear walking on the side and back of the house a lot during the night, but always figured that it was just a stray cat or a skunk or something. One morning, however, around 4 o'clock, I woke up because I heard walking right outside my window. I knew it wasn't an animal, especially when through the faint morning light, I saw a person's head and shoulders move past my bedroom window. My parents told me it was just the wind, but I know what I saw. It was definitely not the wind. My uncle was a truck driver for many years. He spent several years doing cross-country trips, often loading up his trailer in the middle of the night. While he waited for his trailer to be loaded, he would make his way over to a nearby truck stop, have a late-night meal, and shoot the breeze with any other drivers there. After a while, he would make friends with drivers that were on a somewhat similar schedule. He befriended this particular guy that he would run into about once a month or so. One night... The guy invites my uncle back to his truck. He wanted to show him something he built. This guy's semi has a sleeper on the back, so it's very big. Basically, it's a semi truck with a small room right behind the driver's seat to sleep in. My uncle is intrigued by what kind of custom work this guy has done, so he goes along with him. Once they're in the truck, the guy showed him what he built in the sleeper of his semi. It's a big heavy-duty box. Apparently it has hydraulic arms on either side so he can open and close it with the push of a button. He tells my uncle that once he pushes the button it seals shut. It can't be opened. My uncle is kinda weirded out by this and cracks a few jokes about the box. And then the guy starts to get a little agitated. My uncle realizes this and decides that it's time to leave this guy's truck. A few months later he finds out that the guy was a serial killer, stuffing truck stop hookers and others into this custom hydraulic box. At this point in the story, his hand starts shaking and he can barely drink his beer. That guy was massive, he says. His hand could cover most of my head. He could have stuffed me in the box and there's nothing I could have done to stop him. Or maybe there was someone in there already. He says he still has nightmares about it all these years later. When I was growing up, my family moved to a cul-de-sac when I was around eight, and my brother was in the ballpark of nine. We immediately befriended two girls who lived next door to us, who were our ages, and we hung out with them every day. We would frequently go down to a bike path located behind the circle of houses that occupied our street, to ride around on our skateboards, walk to the nearby shopping center it eventually led to, and basically just hang out. The bike path went through the woods, and went in both directions for a long time, and we would often wander into the woods and play in the creek, catch crawfish and frogs, and all that huckleberry fin kind of stuff. Well... The first or second week we lived there, my brother, these two girls, and I were playing around in the creek, a good way down from our house, and we went exploring into a short sewage pipe. 
It was barely 20 feet in total, and you could easily see both ends, which drained into a collection of large rocks. After we had sufficiently crawled around in this sketchy rainwater runoff pipe, we started climbing up the rocks to leave. My brother noticed something in the rocks and picked it up to discover that it was a small, wallet-sized, and relatively recent portrait of himself that had been taken at our school for the yearbook the prior year. It had signs of aging and water damage, and seemed to have been there for a long time. I think our initial reaction was to laugh at my brother for looking goofy or something, but looking back, I can't believe how I didn't see how sinister and weird it was. I was home last year during a break from university with a friend, and we decided to go see a friend in a different city in his university. It was a small city with rivers, hills, and forests. At night, we decided to go in a nearby forest to smoke and drink by the river, but still being on the main road. So, we were standing with our car parked, and I was drinking, while both of them were making joints and smoking. It was about eleven at night, and dead dark with no lights or people for several kilometers. We had been standing there for about an hour when a guy in his twenties came out of the tree line and walked up to me and said, you guys really shouldn't be here this late at night. My friend who used to study there heard me talking to someone and started walking towards me, but then stopped in his tracks. When I noticed him, I saw that his face was white he told me to get in the car and that we were leaving. I told the guy thanks for the advice and that we were leaving and told him goodbye. For ten minutes my friend didn't talk and when we were out of the forest he finally broke his silence and told me that this guy who was talking to me was a boy from his university who had died on the same road two years back in an accident. I told him he must be mistaken but he said he looked exactly like the boy that died. We were so scared that we didn't go home that night and spent the rest of the night getting high by a nearby river. I was home alone and heard the doorbell ring. I opened up to see this man there holding a large square bag. He starts talking about how he's an artist and is opening up a gallery soon, so he wanted to sell a couple of his paintings for a lower price to drum up interest. I'm Canadian and very polite, so I just nodded and let him open the bag and start showing me the paintings. They were nice, couple landscapes, a couple portraits, and then the weird ones started. It started with nude art. First one was painted, and it was all right. And then the second one seemed more photorealistic and depicted a very messed up looking orgy. Then it went through bestiality and then straight up gore and just got really intense and awful. The man stood there flipping through the canvases and grinning at me. At one point, he made a step toward me and I just blurted out that I didn't have any money to pay for anything and then slammed the door in his face. I checked a couple minutes later, and he was just standing there looking at the door. I shouted out from my window that I was going to call the police, and then he left. When I was a teenager, I lived in my father's basement. He would frequently go on business trips, and I would be alone in the house for up to a week at a time. One evening in spring, I was up alone watching TV at around 2 a.m. when I heard through the open windows what sounded like two distinct set of footprints outside, walking from the front yard around the side of the house and into the backyard where they stopped. It was then that I realized that since all my lights were on, I couldn't see outside, but from outside, you could see me. I immediately panicked, shutting off my TV and lights. So now I was alone in my basement 
with no lights on, with what I thought were two people in my backyard. I don't know how long I was frozen in the darkness, but after I didn't hear any more sounds for a while, I quietly crept upstairs to try to get a better look into my backyard. Thankfully, all the lights upstairs were already off. Unfortunately, with the way the bushes and the patio umbrella were set up, there were large blind spots where it sounded like those footsteps stopped. I considered calling 911, but then, when my father would inevitably find out, I knew I would be forced to stay with my aunt when he went out of state. So I stared at that deck, waiting to see movement for at least ten minutes, before I began convincing myself that my mind was playing tricks on me. I decided to go investigate outside. I grabbed the closest thing to a weapon I could find, an old shepherd's axe, went out of my front door and crept around the side of my house, crouching behind a bush. I finally mustered the courage to swing the axe into the bush and shout, Hey! Nothing would happen, right? No one would be there, and I'd have a good laugh, albeit an embarrassed one, when I realized I was just being paranoid. Instead, I immediately heard the sound of deck chairs scraping on wood and two sets of human footsteps running off into the opposite direction. My heart stopped. I felt like I blacked out for a second from the adrenaline rush. I ran back around the side of my house the direction I came from. There was no time to think. I made it to my front door, swung it open, rushed inside and then slammed it shut and stood there in the darkness, practically hyperventilating. I stared out into the street, waiting to see someone leaving the property. But no one did. It was then that I realized that now, I wasn't safe inside my house like I thought I would be. I was trapped. I ran out the front door into the middle of the street where I could scream if I saw someone. Surely by now, I should have called the cops, but I wasn't thinking clearly anymore if I ever was at all. Now I was facing my house, but I still didn't see anyone, so I glanced to the left down the street. Nothing. Then I looked to my right. Two male figures were walking away from me, a block and a half down the street. As soon as I noticed them, they turned left at the T-junction onto the main road and disappeared out of sight. For some reason, I ran after them and when I turned that corner, no one was there. There should have been nowhere to go, and they would have only made it about a half a block if they were walking. They must have had a car waiting, or began running as they turned the corner. What the hell were they planning on doing? I'll never know. I was around 12 years old, and I was asleep in my family's living room, since I was sick and it was winter. My house has terrible insulation, and my room was always cold. So I was asleep, and at around 2 in the morning, I'm woken up to the feeling that there's someone in the room with me. I always slept with a flashlight since I read a lot, so it was in my hands when I woke up. I turned it on and pointed it in the direction of where I thought the person was. Right there, a foot away from me, was a man kneeling down, staring into my face. The light hit his face and he turned and ran away into the darkness. I let out a blood-curdling scream and my mom and dad came running down the stairs. He disappeared and we never found him, but when my dad was checking the house, the back door was wide open. In the house that my family used to live in, there had been three separate occasions where I knew something was wrong. Maybe the house was haunted. I don't know. Situation 1. It's about midnight. The kids and I are woken up by noises in the basement. I tell my husband it sounds like someone is in the house and to go check it out. We continue to hear doors opening and closing and it sounds like stuff is getting thrown around. 
Maybe we had intruders. I'm not sure. We don't have guns or a dog or any way to defend ourselves against an intruder. So, I do what any grown woman would do and call my dad. He has 20 plus years military experience and a very hefty gun collection. So I have my husband sneak out of our room and unlock the door for my dad to come in. Then we all hide in my bedroom with the door locked. As you may have figured, the house was completely empty and there was no sign of anyone. Situation 2. I get home late after a long day at work. It's 2 a.m. and my husband is asleep on the couch. And the kids are asleep in a pile of blankets on the floor next to him. So I decide to take a bath and relax and unwind before heading to bed myself. While I'm in the tub, someone starts turning the doorknob to the bathroom. I figure it's my four-year-old freaking out because sometimes she sleepwalks when she has to go to the bathroom. So I hop out of the tub so I can unlock and open the door to let her in. When I open the door, there's no one there. No one is in the hallway. I grab my towel and walk into the living room, and everyone is right where I left them, still asleep. Situation 3 It's bedtime again. I'm sitting in my bed talking to my daughter, getting her ready for sleep. All of a sudden, she starts crying hysterically and burying her face in me. Was she hurt? What the hell was wrong? I was worried and she wouldn't tell me what was wrong. But she was terrified of something. Finally, she looks up at me and says, He's standing right there, and points to the doorway. I turn around and look. There's no one there. I turn and look back at her and she says, There was a man watching us. Back in junior high, it was the first time my parents left town and left me alone for a week. It was going good. I stayed in the basement, and the entrance to the hallway that leads to my room had decorative beads hanging in the entranceway. I'm in my room watching TV with my faithful dog laying at the foot of my bed. All of a sudden he starts barking wildly, a bark that I had never heard out of him before. It was almost a cry. I think something is wrong with him, and just as I almost get a hand on him, he jumps off the bed and dives under it completely silent. I get to the floor to look under the bed for him, and I hear the beads in the entranceway start to rattle together as if someone ran into them with a lot of force. I spin around and sit there scared shitless for a minute. There's nobody there. Then I grab a bat and go investigate. The beads are still swinging with force. Every door and window in the house is locked. There aren't any air vents close to the beads, and my dog refused to come out from under the bed for another two hours. To this day, I have no idea what caused those beads to rattle, or what scared the hell out of my dog. In a house living with my girlfriend and another couple, I'm watching TV at around 2 a.m. in the living room. My girlfriend is asleep. The other guy is asleep, and I assume the other girl is out in her study, which you had to go outside to get to, so the back door is unlocked. From my vantage point, you can see a portion of the kitchen, which is next to the back door. I hear the back door swing open, assume it's my housemate, and continue watching my TV show. About 15 minutes later, I happened to glance through the doorway into the kitchen, as I hadn't heard my housemate leave the house again, or wander through to the bedrooms. And what do I see? A man standing in the corner of the kitchen looking at me. He had a brown jacket on, dark eyes and dark hair, shoulders slumped, staring at me. When he sees that I've noticed him, he moved out of sight. I get up from the couch and run to the kitchen, but he's gone. I carefully slip out the back door, but there's nobody there. 
out the front door. Nobody. Down the street. Just nowhere to be found. I have no idea who it was or why he was in my house. My four-year-old son can walk, but likes to crawl rapidly while pretending to be animals and such. Several months ago, my wife and I were watching some TV after our kids had gone to bed. Suddenly, late at night, we heard our four-year-old son's bedroom door open, and then the sound of him rapidly crawling down the hallway toward the living room. We figured he was trying to sneak up on us, and was doing poorly. My wife looks at me and mouths the word watch and gets up off the couch she moves toward the hallway and pounces into the entrance to startle our son only to stand up looking confused she looks at me and says there's no one there we go into our son's room and he's completely asleep so of course we go check on our daughters and they are asleep as well we both heard it and it scared the hell out of both of us. It was around 2002, and I had just married my wife, and we had just had our first baby. In the middle of the night, my wife sat up to go check on the baby, and when she put her feet onto the floor next to the bed, she felt a body. She reached down and lifted an arm, she thought it was me on the floor at first, but then she reached over and felt that I was still lying next to her. She screamed. I woke up and turned on the light. There was a man passed out on the floor. I called the police and they took him away. The police think that he broke into our house and passed out next to our bed. The disturbing thing, he was holding a hammer. When I was a kid, 10 years old, I lived out in the country. My best friend lived next door, and there were a lot of open fields around our houses with trees everywhere. One summer, we were out exploring and playing, and found this giant old tree out by a pond, a few miles away from our houses. As we approached the tree, we saw that a girl had climbed it and was sitting in it. We said hello and she said hello back. She told us her name was Sarah. She was really nice, and I thought she was really cute. We sat under the tree and talked with her for a good half an hour before we left. We came back the next day, and she was there again, but this time she was sleeping. We decided not to wake her up and just left. We didn't come back until three days later, and she was there again. As we approached, I felt a sickening feeling in my stomach. I realized she was wearing the same clothes as the last time we saw her there, when she was asleep. I climbed up the tree, and I'll never forget what she looked like. Her face was dirty and was covered in ants. Her cheek was split open and bleeding, and both of her eyes were completely black like someone had been hitting her. We started running home, and on the way there, we saw a man leaning against another tree watching us. He was too far away to make out the details of his face, but I felt strongly right away that he had killed her. When we got home, my parents were not there, so we went and told my friend's dad. He called the police, and his dad didn't let us go back again until the next day. The girl's body was gone. I have no idea where she lived or who that man was. We never saw him again, and as far as I know, he was never caught. We didn't do much exploring after that. I was driving home through back roads I had never been on and came across a bookstore in a tiny town in the woods. The bookstore was actually a house, 
where the front of the home had been converted into a store. There was a box on the porch that said, 50 cent books, so I stopped to see if there were any Stephen King books in there. A middle-aged woman comes out with a huge smile that seemed a little disturbing and gave me a bowl of fruit and some tea. Even though the woman kind of creeped me out, I thought this was pretty cool. I rifled through the books while eating the fruit and drinking the tea. Inside the store, or the house, there were a lot of cool art books and stuff. So I spent some more time in there. She brought me some more tea. Even when I said I didn't want any more. She kept refilling it. She gave me a dessert, too. Brownies and cookies. I didn't realize it at the time, but she had been slipping things into my drink. It's very hazy to remember the details, but at some point, she closed the shop, telling me to take my time looking at the books. She told me that she was going to go take a shower and was gone for a while. When I was finally done, I had my books in hand and was ready to pay. I wandered to the back of the house to find her. I found her in her bedroom. She was lying in bed, naked. This of course was very alarming. You might think this is kind of a sexy situation, but it wasn't. She was an elderly woman and had been telling me how I reminded her of her kids in college. I told her I was ready to pay, trying not to look at her, and she told me how to open the register. So I went and opened it, put in what I thought I owed, took out the change and left. When I stumbled outside, a fire truck drove by, screaming with sirens. In the distance was a glow of a big forest fire, and the stars were being covered by smoke. A tall man on a horse watched the fire truck pass. He looked at me, took a piece of wood or something out of his mouth, and said, The town is burning. I swear to God I have a crystal clear memory of this happening, even though I'm sure it couldn't have. By this point, I guess I was seriously just tripping out on something. I'm not a substance guy, so I don't know what I had, but I was out of my mind and could hardly walk. I got back in my car and drove home along twisting roads on tall cliffs above an ocean. Twice I realized I was on the wrong side of the road. One of the times I realized this because a massive truck was headed straight for me, laying on the horn and flashing its lights. I kept thinking about how my car could be like an airplane and a submarine if I drove it off the cliff. I can't believe I made it home alive. Later, I realized I was in that house for about seven hours, looking at books the whole time. At least, that's what I hope I was doing. I used to live next to a hospital. One day, walking home, I was stopped by an old man who clearly had trouble seeing. He asked me to help him cross the road to the hospital. I agreed, and he grabbed a hold of my hand very tightly. At this point, I noticed his fingers were stained brown from tobacco, covered in scabs, and his fingernails were very long and dirty. I started to think that my good deed for the day would be a bit regrettable. When we got to the other side of the road, he still had my hand grasped so tightly I couldn't politely pull it away. Do you want to see my eye? He asked. One of his eyes was squeezed shut. With his free hand, he pulled the lids apart, and I realized to my horror that he had no eyeball, just an empty socket. I started babbling, still trying to be polite, about how that was very interesting, but I had to go. Then he uttered the immortal words, Do you want to put your finger in it? He was pulling really hard on my hand, trying to force my finger into his empty eye socket. At this point, I gave up on politeness and struggled my hand free and just ran away. I could hear him laughing as I ran off.
When I was a child, I was always stricken by this irrational fear that when I went outside at night, I had to walk straight into the house without looking back, because if I looked back, someone would be following me. One day after dinner, I went out to the car to get my book bag, and I was continuing my ritual of walking straight inside without looking back. Adrenaline pumping, anxiety going full force, and I just stopped and said to myself, this is stupid, and I turned around. I saw what appeared to be someone crouched down behind my car and was peeking their head around. They were just staring at me and smiling. It appeared to be a woman, maybe in her forties or fifties, with curly hair. We made eye contact for a second, and then she ducked back behind the car where I couldn't see her. I stood frozen for a second and then ran inside. I told my mom, and she went outside to check. There was no one there. My mom didn't exactly not believe me, but she didn't seem very concerned, either. Back in the 70s, my grandfather dropped my grandmother, my mom, and her two sisters off to do some shopping on his way to work. Since he had gone to work and wasn't able to pick them up, they hitchhiked home. My mom at the time was only around 10 or 11 years old. Middle sister would have been around 7 or 8. And the youngest was a 1-year-old baby. They get picked up by a guy in a pickup truck who has them all sit in the back row with one of them holding the baby. My grandmother was giving directions to their home from the highway but the guy ignored her and went by their exit, claiming that he had to make a stop first. He didn't really say much else to them during the drive, but my mom remembers my grandmother being very quiet and very nervous. Eventually, they come up to a farm when the driver tells them to wait in the car and goes inside the house. While he's gone, they just sit there terrified. They're in the middle of nowhere, and no, they couldn't make it out on foot. A few minutes later, the driver comes out with a second guy who looks into the truck and sees my mom's youngest sister, the baby. He starts flipping out, screaming at the driver that he shouldn't have brought the baby back and that they aren't going to do anything with her. He ends up telling him to get them away from the farm. The driver gets back into the truck, apologizes, and they get back on the highway and drive again in silence. My grandmother, normally a very smart woman, had him drive directly to their house, although I suspect her reasoning was she had already given him the address before anything seemed off. They lived at that house for several years, and luckily never saw either of those men again. I love to ride my bike along country roads. Not far from where I live is a tiny town called Three Oaks, Michigan. One Saturday, my wife was working and I had nothing to do, so I strapped my bike to my car and drove the hour to Three Oaks. I parked in the scenic downtown area and then rode out of the town and into the surrounding countryside. As I wound my way further into the remote countryside, Houses, businesses, and cars grew increasingly scarce. Eventually, there were only an occasional house or two every half mile or so, and cornfields and small woods flanking the dirt and gravel roads that I pedaled down. It's on one of those back roads where a minivan drove past me. Within moments of it passing, it turned around, pulled up alongside me. I looked over at the passenger a woman in her mid to late twenties was looking at me with her window down. The driver, a man of seemingly the same age, leaned over the passenger and said to me in a slight southern drawl and with a big smile on his face, Hey, do you know David Christ? I thought for a brief second, but I don't know any David Christ, so I said so. The driver said, 
You don't know him at all? I said that I didn't and apologized and then pedaled on. The van sat for a moment longer and then pulled a U-turn and drove off in the direction it was originally heading. I thought nothing of the encounter. Maybe the driver was a friend of David Christ, and he thought we had met through David or something. I don't know. At the time, I didn't think I had any reason to worry. I continued on my ride, turning down this road and heading north, and then turning down that road and heading east. I didn't have any agenda. I was just out to enjoy the summer day and meander through the relaxing countryside. Maybe ten minutes later, and on an entirely new road, and heading an entirely different direction from the one I had first met the van, I saw the van again. We were heading toward each other, and I gave a smile and a nod as I passed the driver. I remember thinking it was an odd coincidence that I should come across this van again. The driver stared as he passed me, and he had a big smile on his face. At this point, I began wondering what they were doing. They might be lost in looking for this David Christ guy. Or maybe they just enjoy a scenic drive and thought I looked like a friend of a friend or something. I didn't know, but at that point, I was starting to think about the situation a little more critically. I continued taking a twisting, turning, meandering path, taking this road, and then turning onto that, heading north, south, west, east. Then, I came across the van again. Again, they were heading in my direction, and I pulled alongside them. The driver rolled down his window and leaned out. He was a late twenties white man with a few inches of goatee and a baseball cap. He had a large smile plastered across his face again. I stopped my bike and looked at him, waiting for him to say something, and he just looked at me for a good thirty seconds. Now, thirty seconds doesn't sound like a long time, does it? But you go flag down a stranger and then just stare at them for thirty seconds, and you'll realize that in that kind of a situation, thirty seconds is a lifetime. Finally, he spoke and said, Hey, do you know David Christ? The same question. This time, there was no smile on his face. He stared at me, and I was thinking to myself, Is he joking? Does he really not remember asking me the same question twenty minutes ago? Is he just being funny? Is he high? Is he drunk? After a moment, I told him that I still didn't know anyone by the name of David Christ, and I pedaled off down the road. It's at that time that I realized exactly in how remote of an area I was. I peered down the road I was on and didn't see a house on its entire length. I was flanked by a cornfield on one side and a forest on the other. I looked over my shoulder and saw the van slowly driving down the road behind me. It couldn't be a coincidence that I came across this van three times now, not with me taking random roads, heading different directions. It made no sense why anyone driving would take that same maze of roads. The only thing they could have been doing was just driving around. But why would they stop me and ask the same question twice? It was quite strange and I was beginning to become a little concerned. I decided to begin to head back toward the town center. I pedaled hard, and the gravel road ahead of me continued with a bend to the right. As I neared the fork, who should come around the bend but the same van? I gripped my pocket knife, which I always take with me on rides like this, just in case, and then realized... All they would have to do is run me down with the van, and I would be in serious trouble. As the van drew closer, I was ready to jump off and run into the cornfields. The van slowed down as it approached me, and the driver rolled his window down and leaned out again. But this time, I didn't stop riding. I increased my speed even though I knew I could never outrun the van if they gave chase. 
I looked over my shoulder and saw the van sitting in the middle of the road. I took the right fork and continued on the gravel road until I could no longer see the van behind the corn rows, and then I stopped. I got off my bike and crept along the cornfield until I was at its edge. I peeked down the road I had just been on. The van was in the distance driving away from me. I ran back to my bike, and then as soon as the van was entirely out of sight, I turned around and took the left fork along the dirt path. I rode as fast as I could, knowing that if the people in the van had nefarious things in mind, and if they caught me on this dirt path, flanked by cornfields and far from an area that anyone would come across us, that would be the time that they would move in on me. My ruse worked, or perhaps the van was never after me at all, and I made it the rest of the way to the town center without seeing them again. When I got home later that day, I was still replaying the events in my head, and the name David Christ kept creeping through my mind. Was David Christ someone famous, I wondered? Like a musician? Should I have known David Christ? I decided to Google the name. I tried a couple of different spellings for Christ, but it was the C-R-I-S-T spelling that revealed a terrifying result. I came across a newspaper article from Knoxville, Tennessee. The article explained how a man named David Christ had turned himself in after stabbing another man at a gas station in 2013. The article included a photo of this criminal, David Christ, and I believe it was the same man that was driving the van. Add a baseball cap and a few inches of a goatee, and the man in the van was a dead ringer for David Christ. I did an inmate search of Knox County, and there was no David Christ in the inmate population. Somehow, David Christ escaped. Or maybe he was never convicted, as I couldn't find any articles about sentencing. In less than two years after attacking the guy, for some reason, he had made his way to Michigan. Why was he driving along these back roads? Who was the woman in the passenger seat? And why did he keep asking if I knew of him? Do I know David Christ? Yes, I do now. This story happened about a year ago, and it was pretty out there even for me. I was about 20 at the time that this occurred, and I am a female. So last year, I moved back in with my dad, after having lived out of state for some time. At the time, my stepmom, little half-sister, stepbrother, Jay, and his girlfriend, Cam, and her child, Leela, were also all living there too. My stepmom has a way of just letting people live in my dad's house, and my dad has no balls and doesn't say anything until something big happens, which it always inevitably does. So, not long after I moved in, my stepbrother was kicked out for illegal activity. But Cam and Leela stayed with us. I think, to my stepmom, Cam was this perfect person. And I don't really know. Just for a side note, Leela was Cam's daughter, but not my stepbrother's kid. No relation at all. Now Cam was about 18 at the time, and Leela was a little over two. Cam and I became loose friends because we were living together and I would help babysit Leela when Cam had to go to work. Eventually, we both got boyfriends. She started dating a guy she met at work and I started dating 
someone who I knew from high school. I thought her new boyfriend was great, but the terms of him visiting were kind of weird. He was legitimately visiting his girlfriend, who was living in her ex-boyfriend's parents' house. Kind of weird, but whatever. So little by little, I start noticing that my stuff was disappearing. Small stuff at first, like socks or panties, mainly thongs. The kind of stuff you just assume gets lost in the wash. But then my perfume started to go missing. Suddenly, jackets, dresses, shoes, and jeans and bras were also missing. Now, sometimes I would find these things in her room, and other times, she would suddenly appear with them after I mentioned not being able to find something. On days. I would come home and find a large amount of stuff missing. Cam would make up wild stories about Jay breaking into our house when no one was home to steal girls' clothes. Yep, she tried to get me to believe that. Even went as far as bending out of a window screen and breaking the window lock to try and prove this. This honestly. Wasn't the most extreme thing Cam did to try and get me to believe her insane stories. Eventually, we got into a big argument because my brand new car had been messed with, and I basically accused Cam of going through my car and taking my stuff. Now, while Cam was younger, I was somewhat scared of her. I am very thin and petite, so I don't put up much of a fight. But Cam was taller and stronger, and had already struck me on occasions prior to this. So, in retrospect, any angry accusation was probably a bad idea, since it was just us and one of her friends home. Cam threatened to beat me senseless. Among other colourful things, and I eventually backed off and left. Things went back to normal for a day or so, until one night, Cam literally freaked out because her boyfriend was out of town, and I was hanging out with my own boyfriend, so she had nobody to give her attention. Now, when I say freak out. I mean, Cam started claiming she was pregnant by her boyfriend, in an attempt to make him come home. Problem was, Cam's boyfriend was going to school to be a doctor, and knew that since she was still recovering from a personal medical condition, it was literally impossible for her to be pregnant, especially not the amount of weeks. She was trying to say she was. So he called me, and had me search the house for a supposed pregnancy test, which is disgusting, by the way. But I couldn't find one. So he confronted Cam over the phone about it, and she admitted that she was lying because she wanted him to come home. I'm going to add that he had been gone for less than six hours at this point. And that he was visiting family only a few hours away. So, he told Cam he'd be back in a couple of days, and things seemed to settle down. Cam seemed to calm down, and I went to bed. Later that night, Cam's boyfriend called me again, going on about how Cam had called him, threatening to kill herself unless he came home right then and there. But that his car was messed up, and it was about 1 a.m., and nobody was going to give him a two-hour ride back home right now. So I go into Cam's room, and she's laying on her bed in the dark, and she has a pill bottle in her hand. She's rambling about how she wants to die, and that she wants her boyfriend. And that if he doesn't come, she will just kill herself, and she doesn't care that Lila won't have a mother. 
Well, I freak out. Wake up my stepmom, who basically yells at Cam to throw up any of the pills she's taken and then goes back to bed. Great family, right? So yet again, Cam admits about lying about the pills and was just hoping her boyfriend would come home to get her. As if he thought she was going to kill herself, he'd have to come then and there. Foolproof plan, right? Well, he didn't come, obviously. And Cam calls Jay to come pick her up and rides off with him, leaving Leela behind. I put Leela in my parents' room, in her playpen, and then I left because I was done. But apparently, Jay dropped Cam back off later, and her boyfriend, who had finally gotten a ride into town, finds Cam cheating on him with Jay. They got into a fight, and then I guess Cam started with the whole suicide thing again. So her boyfriend called the police and had her Baker acted, which is basically when they lock up people threatening self-harm in a psych ward for 72 hours to get them to calm down. Alright, here is the point where it gets kind of crazy. So after Cam got Baker acted, myself and two friends went through Cam's room and found a lot of missing stuff from all of us hidden away and sometimes even stuffed in Leela's diaper bags or toy boxes. One of the friends also warned me and they went and showed me that Cam had mixed a tropical ingredient I was severely allergic to in my body wash, which could have hospitalized me for that kind of exposure. Cam had also peed in my shampoo and body spray, put blue dye in my toothpaste in an attempt to dye my mouth blue, and put green dye in my conditioner in an attempt to get me fired for having unnatural hair colour. Thankfully, I hadn't showered at home in two days, so none of it ever got used. The toothpaste I had noticed beforehand, and went ahead and replaced both that and my toothbrush without using it which turned out to be a good thing because Cam had also supposedly thrown my toothbrush in the toilet. But here's the icing on the cake. Cam worked at a hospital and had somehow gotten her hands on one of those drinks that you empty into someone's cup and then that goes on to empty their entire system, i.e. an extremely powerful laxative. I think it's one of the ones that they make you have just before a colonoscopy. She had planned to put it in my next drink, next time I left it out. Just to make me really sick. Because I accused her, rightfully so, of stealing my stuff. Cam also tried to tell people that my boyfriend was coming on to her and talking to her behind my back, which was a complete lie. The amount of charges I would have filed against this girl was insane, but I opted not to, because my dad and stepmom, while thinking it was serious, didn't think it would be morally right, since Cam was obviously not okay in the head. I was also pretty pissed that Cam's friends had waited until Cam had gotten locked up to tell me all about this stuff and would have knowingly let me get sick and possibly die because of what Cam was tampering with. But if you think it ends there, you're wrong. The day before she got released from the psych ward, Cam had been calling me and the same two friends were begging us to come and collect her on the day that she was getting released. However, we all agreed that it was not in our best interest to do so. So lo and behold, her release day comes and nobody shows up to collect her. I must have had eight or nine missed calls on my cell phone alone from her. And I have no idea just how many times she decided to ring the other girls. 
One of the other friends did text me though and say that she had finally given in and called the psych ward but by the time she called they told her that Cam had apparently left with a random guy who had a family member in the psych ward. The friend also warned me that Cam was probably going to try and come to my house which was the same friend who had been in on the tampering of my items and stealing of my stuff. So I was a little torn on whether or not to believe her. But I decided to go around the house, locking all the doors and windows and closing all the curtains and blinds. I seriously doubted she would be dumb enough to come to my house after my parents had called the psych ward and told them that she was no longer welcome at our address and that when she was released, they needed to make sure she went to her mother's house a few towns over, as we had already sent all of her stuff back to her mother. But still the same. I wanted the house to be secure since I was home alone. Well, either Cam didn't get the memo about not being allowed at my house, or she just got it but just didn't give a shit. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning and I am sitting in the bathroom straightening my hair. When all of a sudden, I hear someone legitimately pounding on the front door. It startled me so badly, I dropped my incredibly hot straightener on my foot. It wasn't just a one-time hit, and then it stopped. The pounding continued on without end, almost rhythmically. Now, my bathroom is on the other side of the house from the front door, so once I recovered from the initial shock, I flipped off the bathroom lights and ran into my bedroom. My theory was that if the house looked empty, maybe Cam would just give up and go back to her own home. My car was in the driveway, sure, but I often left my car behind to ride carpool with co-workers or my boyfriend would pick me up to go out. It was probably naive of me to think that she would just give up. But you can't blame a girl for hoping. Well, pretty soon, Cam's pounding became relentless and she started yelling as she was pounding. Being on the other side of the house, I couldn't make out most of what Cam was saying but I was really hoping the doors held up to her fists. We had those stupid, mostly glass double doors at the front, and I was beginning to wonder if Cam was just considering breaking the glass in order to get in. So I frantically started texting my stepmom and dad, asking them what I should do. Of course, there is absolutely no reply, since they were both at work and were over an hour away from the house. So basically, I'm full on panicking trying to decide if I should hide and wait it out or call the police. My boyfriend worked night shifts, so he was still asleep and I felt completely and utterly alone. Like I had never felt so terrified all alone at once. The feeling was pretty indescribable. Well, after about 20 minutes of relentless pounding, it stops, and I think that perhaps Cam has given up. I started to stand up from where I had been crouched, when suddenly I heard my name being called. She started yelling, saying that she knew I was in there, and to open the bloody door, followed by another barrage of pounding. But this time, it was coming from my bedroom window. Cam was literally feet away from me, only separated by a thin glass window, which thankfully was covered by a very heavy curtain. I was already beginning to think that she would smash through that window. Just because she assumed I was in there, and had not replied to her at all. Cam then moved to the side of the house and tried the bathroom window, 
and then switched back to the front door in record time. She must have been running laps around the house in order to pull it off. This went on for another 20 minutes or so, and I was beginning to wonder if the windows were going to be able to manage her assault for much longer. Then suddenly it got really quiet. Her yelling turned into soft whining, like she was going to cry. She called my name again, asking for me to let her in. She said, We were friends. I don't understand why you're doing this. She started to say something else, but then she started laughing an evil, sickening laugh, like she couldn't keep the act up anymore and then fell completely silent. Taking advantage of the silence, I moved out into the kitchen so that I could have access to an escape route should I need one. You see, my kitchen is at the centre of the house. From the kitchen, I could easily get to my garage door, to the front door and the patio deck doors. Not only this, but I could easily get to what was once Cam's room, which also had a door to the patio deck in it. Now I didn't dare try running for my parents' room, as I would have had to pass the front doors in order to get there. But I was really wishing I could, because that's where all the guns were. Not that I would have shot Cam, but it would have been very nice to feel at least somewhat protected. Suddenly, the silence gave way to the loud slam of the back gate, and then I realised that Cam is now on the patio deck. I held my breath as Cam went and checked every door, including the one that went into her former bedroom. She actually spent a fair amount of time on this one, I guess hoping it would break loose or something. Or maybe there was some trick to try and get it open that I didn't know about. But when that didn't work, Cam began screaming. She wasn't really saying anything, just yelling out sounds. It was honestly quite eerie, and I remember feeling like I was in some twisted horror movie. I hear our heavy metal patio furniture getting thrown around and the sound of glass shattering as one of the tables connected with the concrete. There were also a couple of splashes as the table and some of the chairs ended up in the pool. I thought for sure a chair was going to come flying through the sliding glass door at any minute. But then, as quickly as it had started, it stopped and I heard the back gate slam shut. It had gotten silent again until I heard a strange scratching sound. It took me a minute to realise what it was, but at that moment I realised Cam had begun to fiddle with the windows in the bathroom that was attached to her old bedroom. It was one of those foggy shower windows that are somewhat small and closer to the ceiling than your average window. In an instant, I realised Cam had probably dragged a chair to stand on it in order to reach the window. I knew it was locked though. I had made sure that window was locked. Hadn't I? I suddenly began to panic as I realised I couldn't remember if I had checked that window or not. Not to mention Cam had already broken this lock once so who's to say she couldn't have done it again? But I could still hear her huffing and yelling in frustration so I was hoping she was struggling with it and wouldn't be able to break it a second time. I had now moved back and was cowered directly under the next door to the room that led into the garage. This one was the one place that was close to an exit whilst also providing decent cover from every window. I felt safer knowing she could not see me here but also knowing that I had an escape route right there if I needed it. It had gotten quiet again, and I desperately, yet stupidly, hoped that this time Cam might have really given up. I pictured her huffing and stomping back to whoever was waiting for her and telling them to just drive her home to her mother's house. My stomach turned as I suddenly felt sick 
as I realised she could have help. It would explain her getting around the house so fast and the ability to throw such heavy furniture. I had completely forgotten that there was some random guy out there with her. I began to feel even more scared than I had before and the need to run for it. That he might be waiting out there somewhere to grab me and I began to rethink my escape plan and started to think that perhaps hiding was better. All of this was interrupted when I heard the single most terrifying sound I had ever heard up till that point. You see, the handle on the door that led to what had formerly been Cam's room had gotten broken the night of her insanity and you now had to fiddle with it to get it to open as the doorknobs didn't line up properly. And that was the sound I was hearing. Someone was shaking the doorknob ever so softly and quietly, but forcefully trying to get the door open. I strained my ears as Cam struggled with the doorknob before finally a small click. She succeeded in opening the door and I realised with terror that I was now in the house with Cam and I had no idea if she was armed or what she would do if she found me cowering in the corner by the door or if she had that guy with her. In retrospect, I really had no idea on much of anything. Without waiting another second, I burst through the garage door while simultaneously slamming my hand on the button to raise the door. I tucked and rolled under the door before it had risen completely, scraping my knee in the process. And as I got to my feet, I saw a huge beefy guy standing by a truck near the edge of the driveway watching me. He began to take a step towards me and I took off running. I sprinted between houses and up onto the golf course where I was literally in the middle of all the golfers. Not that they gave two shits about a girl half dressed crying. Once there I called 911 and collapsed on the golf course as I waited for the police to show up. They came in without sirens and asked me to walk up to the gatehouse at the front of the neighbourhood to meet me before they searched my house. As I walked up towards the gatehouse, I saw a truck driving out of the neighbourhood, and the guy driving kind of tipped his head in my direction and sped up past the cops. It happened too fast for me to get a license plate number, and when I told the police, they sent a singular cop car after the guy. But as far as I know, with no license plate, name or much of a description other than white male driving a white truck, they never caught the guy. Unfortunately, this is where it gets anticlimactic. My stepmom showed up, having read my texts but didn't respond. She flew in the neighbourhood past me and the cops when she was soon followed by Jay. I was told they went in the house and found Cam ransacking my room while brandishing a kitchen knife. They calmed her down and then my stepmom went outside. My boyfriend had showed up at this point, so he drove me back up to the house behind the police, who were still fully prepared to search. When the police strolled up to the driveway and to search the house, my stepmom made up some lie about how she had told Cam she was allowed to go to the house, that she'd forgotten to tell her about it, and that I had overreacted because of the way Cam acted the other night, and that I was prone to anxiety and being overdramatic, blah blah blah. It was all bullshit, basically. It was all a lie. A crock of shit. I was furious and have never wanted to hit my stepmom more than I wanted to that day. She basically made me look like a complete idiot to the cops. My stepmom had Jay take Cam to her mum's house and the cops basically treated me like I was a waste of their time and the stupid kid that called the cops. They told me, with something like that, check with your family first before calling us next time and left. 
as if I hadn't sent multiple texts to both my stepmom and dad. The cops around here aren't known for being amazing anyway, and they basically proved to me how incompetent they were that day. As for Cam, well, she got away with it all. She cyber-stalked me for a while on Facebook and Instagram. Nothing threatening, but made sure she knew what I was up to, and made sure I knew that she knew. One day about a month later, she actually did come back to the house to let my stepmom babysit Leela, and while she was in the house, she and her friends stole more of my shit, just to prove that she could, I suppose. Supposedly, she was telling people I didn't deserve the things I had, and that she didn't feel bad taking my stuff, because I had too much stuff that I didn't deserve. After that one, though, my stepmom told her not to come to the house anymore, and cut off most contact with her. Recently, I heard Cam con some guy into marrying her after dating her for about a month, and they moved across the country to be near his family. Ironically, they moved into a town literally 45 minutes from where my biological mother lives, so I guess there is a small chance I could see her again. But I haven't heard anything from her in almost a year. Her friends still live around here and occasionally say shit to me or try and stir up problems. But I recently moved in with my boyfriend, so Cam no longer knows where I live and I've changed my phone number. I deleted all my social networks except for Reddit, but did take an extended leave from my account. And that is pretty much it. I really hope never to meet that psychopath again. My name is Alyssa. And I am sharing with you a very personal story of mine. I can honest to God, right hand on the Bible, say that everything you are about to hear is 100% true. I know everyone who says that makes it kind of hard to believe. But I wish... I was just making up a story purely for attention. But these things I am going to tell you truly happened to me when I was younger. I never fully believed in ghosts or anything like that, because I had never witnessed anything paranormal with my own two eyes. So I always had my doubts. I wasn't a total unbeliever, but I suppose you could have considered me a skeptic. But all of that changed when I had to live in a house where I was terrorised by spirits. I've always been very into the paranormal world because it's always piqued my interest. Especially when you're listening to other people's ghost stories or watching a scary ghost movie on the TV. It's all very cool to hear when it's not your own story and it's not you personally having the terrifying things happen to you. I never talk about this to anyone because I hate having to relive the nightmare and pure hell I went through every day while living in an old house of mine. This wasn't easy for me, it sounds silly, but until you have experienced the absolute terror and fear of living in an extremely active house, you won't ever know just how much it can take a toll on someone. I lived in a small three-bedroom house here in a small little town by the name of Troy in Missouri. 
it's just a small, out-in-the-middle-of-nowhere little city. Everyone pretty much knew everyone. Rumours would usually spread very quickly in high school. Just one of those kind of towns. We had a cute little house that was on the corner of Main Street. When you walked out the front door and stepped onto the porch, the nice view you got were the massive town's cemetery, right smack dab across the street from our house. So you can only imagine the first thought that came to my mind when we pulled up to the house that we were going to move into. When I saw that the cemetery was no more than 30 steps from our front yard, I thought, great, this place is most definitely haunted. Although at the time, I was just joking with myself. But the cuteness and coziness of the home itself was enough to get my mind off even possibly being haunted. I finally had my own bedroom, after living with my grandma and grandpa at their small cramped house. My sister and I had to share a room over there, as well as with numerous previous houses we lived in. We always shared a room with each other. She is almost eight years older than I, so I had absolutely no say or had any part in decorating our bedroom. She was the oldest, so she made the rules for how the room should look. She didn't want my Paramore, Papa Roach and Lincoln Park posted plasters all over the wall. So I had to settle with Little Wayne, John Cena and Jersey Shore pictures all over for years. Definitely not my sort of taste in music or television. But we finally had our own bedrooms, so I could actually decorate and have my room the way that I wanted. And nobody could tell me that I couldn't have the things I wanted on my own walls and whatnot. That, and I finally had my own privacy, and my own personal area I could go to when I felt I needed to escape or distance myself from my family. It was nice at first. We all seemed to be pretty content with the house and how things were coming along. It was about a week or two after we moved into the house that something weird began to happen. My room was all set up how I wanted. My parents had just finished hanging pictures on the wall and painting and making last minute adjustments to the place, making it look all nice and tried to make it feel as much like home as possible. I had come home from school one afternoon and my parents had both worked together in a big warehouse type place at the time. So they worked awful hours. They were usually home by the time dinner needed to start being made. But I almost always came home from school to an empty home. I would generally be home alone for a few hours until both my parents came home, or at least until my older sister came home from being out with her friends and partying the night before. I remember one specific day when I came home from school alone. I put my school bag down on the back of the kitchen chairs and went to the fridge to look for something to eat. I went and sat on the couch in the living room and turned on the television and just sat and relaxed for a few minutes, watching whatever stupid reality show I was into around that time and snacked on my chips. I remember feeling like there was someone watching me from across the room. Like, as if someone was standing in the corner of the living room, just staring at me. I don't know what it was, but something was urging me to look over in the direction 
of where I felt this presence. I heard a voice yell in the back of my head, Look at me. But it wasn't my voice. So when I finally gained the courage to look over that way, I saw these terrifying two glowing red eyes from the shadows just looking at me. I was so afraid that I was paralysed from fear. I couldn't talk. I couldn't scream as I wanted to. I couldn't do anything but just stare back at whatever was staring at me. I had never felt that kind of pure, intense fear to where I was literally paralysed. It couldn't have been more than 10 to 15 seconds that I was looking at those red eyes from the dark corner, but it felt like hours. I finally pried myself off the couch and sprinted down the hallway into my bedroom, locked the door and called my mother's cell phone at work. She tried to calm me down as best she could with just her voice over the phone. But when she realised I was genuinely terrified and sobbing like a damn baby, she told me that her and dad would wrap up at work and head home. So I stayed locked up in my bedroom until they both arrived 45 minutes later. Little did I know that this was simply the beginning of our story. It was about a month after that incident that I came home from school, yet again all alone, and I had already almost forgotten about what had happened just weeks before, being wrapped up in piles of homework, trying to catch up on my assignments and everything else. It was just kind of pushed into the back of my mind. I sat at the dining room table and was playing games on my laptop when I heard what sounded like my mum's voice calling out my name from downstairs in the basement. I was super confused because I thought she was at work. In fact, I knew she was at work. So I carefully and cautiously got up from the table and inched my way around the corner to where the basement stairs are off the dining room, around the corner a little bit. I then heard my mum again call out my name. Alyssa. But this time it sounded like she was struggling with something, like she needed help carrying laundry baskets up the stairs or something. She just had a sound in her tone of voice as in that she needed assistance. So I walked down the first couple of steps to where I could kind of peek around the corner to verify if anyone was actually down there. Something just felt off about the voice. Even though it was clearly my mother's voice, every single hair on my body was standing straight on end. I think it knew that something was wrong. I just had a really weird feeling about the situation, and to my shock, I saw nobody down there at all. I booked it back up the steps, grabbed the house phone and ran out the back door. I stood at the end of the driveway and called my dad's cell phone. My heart sank into the depths of my stomach when I heard my mother answer his phone. Hey sweetie, what's up? she asked me. I literally remember feeling as if I was almost ready to throw up. I was so scared. If I was actually talking to my mother on the phone, then who was calling my name from the basement? Why did it just sound like my mum? Or what would I have seen if I actually went all the way down the stairs fully? After that experience, I was way too scared to come home from school and be alone after that. So for the next few weeks, my parents had my grandma, who lived a few neighbourhoods over, come pick me up from school every day, and either stayed at the house with me until my parents came home, or brought me over to her house 
where her and my dad would pick me up from over there when they got off work. I felt so much better and much calmer when I had someone there with me in that scary ass house. I didn't feel like anything was there when someone else was there with me. It was almost like whatever was in the house, like scaring me when I was alone and vulnerable. But one day, my grandma wasn't able to pick me up from school because she was a nurse and had gotten called into work at the emergency room. So I found myself all alone in that house until my parents got off work. I don't remember anything that happened that day, but I was most definitely on edge the whole time waiting on my parents to pull up to the driveway. One night I was sleeping and I was awoken up out of a dead deep sleep for some unknown reason. I sat up in my bed, stretched out a little bit and rubbed my eyes. I looked over at my alarm clock and remember it being somewhere around 3.20 a.m. I was so confused as to why I was awake at this god-awful hour of the night. So I sat up at the edge of my bed and was going to go to the kitchen to get something to drink and then go right back to bed. When I was about to stand up and walk out of my bedroom, I heard the sound of heavy footsteps walking up and down the hallway. The whole hallway and kitchen was all hardwood floors, and it sounded like big heavy boots were walking just back and forth from my bedroom door, down to my parents' bedroom, and then back to mine again. It steadily did this for about two minutes. I was trying to figure out why one of my parents were awake, and why they were just walking back and forth through the house at such hours of the night. When I got to my bedroom door and went to reach and open the door, I shit you not, my door handle began shaking like someone was trying to open the door, but it was locked in the handle, jiggling the door handle and jiggling it very violently, causing the entire door to rattle. It scared the absolute hell out of me, and I jumped back and shrieked. I guess my mum, who was the heaviest sleeper in the world, heard me and ran to check what was wrong. I told her what was happening, and she just shrugged it off and tried telling me I was half asleep and that everything was fine, that I was just imagining things. But I know I wasn't imagining things. I know what I saw. I know what I heard, and of course no one believed me. She wasn't awake to hear what I heard, and it made me really angry to know that she did not believe me when I explained it to her. The activity after that died down for a long time. It was so nice to come home and not have to worry about something creepy happening to me. I was beginning to think I was starting to go crazy. Since I had experienced what I previously did, and then nothing else had happened after. I was comfortable in my own home. I actually felt safe being there. But all that changed pretty quickly. It was like, just as soon as I thought it was all over, it came back with a vengeance, stronger than it was before. I was taking a shower one evening, and my mother was downstairs doing laundry, and my dad was out in the garage working on his car. I had the bathroom door completely shut, and nobody would have just walked in on me in the shower anyway, with there being only one bathroom in the house. If anyone needed to relieve themselves during my shower time, they would have knocked first before waltzing right on in there. I was just about done showering, when I felt a really cold breeze zip past me. It was such a strong breeze that I remember the shower curtain actually moved, as if someone opened up the bathroom door and then shut it really fast 
and the wind of the doors closing waved the curtains a little bit. But when I peeked out into the bathroom, no one was there. I hurried up and finished up in there. But I got that immediate feeling of being watched once again. As I went to bend down to shut off the water, I heard this really deep, super creepy, masculine cackle-like laugh. And it was the scariest thing I've heard in my entire life. My whole body was covered in goosebumps. I ran out of there with just a towel wrapped around my body and went straight across the hall into my bedroom. All I could do was sit there and just cry. I literally was beginning to feel like I was going crazy at this point. Nobody believed me and I was the only one experiencing this shit. Whatever was in the house was targeting me and only me. I didn't understand why this was all happening to me, but all I wanted was for it to stop. I hated being in that house all alone, and I didn't want to have this shit happen to me anymore. I was tired of it. I was starting to go into this really deep depression, and I felt so alone. So, I had a friend stay a few nights with me one weekend, and I had told her a lot about what had been going on since I moved in and she wanted to see what I was talking about. She believed me but she wanted to see it for herself. She was super into ghosts and the spirit world. I was just really worried that whatever this thing was wasn't going to do anything while she was here with me and for her to believe that I was crazy too. We cuddled up together on the living room couch my parents had gone out with some friends this night in particular, and my sister wasn't there. My two brothers were with my grandma, so it was just my friend and I alone in the house. I remember we were watching the new remake of Friday the 13th. We had a big bowl of popcorn right between us, and I remember the part had come on the movie, and it was a bit of a jump scare. My friend jumped so hard the entire bowl of popcorn went everywhere. We laughed about it for a solid five minutes, and then I went to grab the trash bag and clean up the big pieces while she went to fetch the vacuum cleaner. I didn't see it in the hall closet where it usually was, so I told her it might be downstairs, since my mom was doing some cleaning earlier that morning. So she went downstairs to go look for it, and not even 10 seconds after she'd gone downstairs, I heard her scream. She sprinted up the stairs, and I was standing at the top of the stairs, wondering what she was screaming for, and she ran right into me. She was running so fast up the stairs, she had tears streaming down her face, and I could see the pure terror and just sheer fear in her eyes. I asked her what the hell happened, and what she told me sent chills down my spine. Still to this day, just as I recount this, it gives me goosebumps. She told me she was looking for the vacuum, and when she went to grab it, she heard something in the other part of the basement. So, she went to peek around the corner to see what it was, and she told me, she looked around the corner and she saw this thick, black, misty, smoky, human-like figure just floating a few inches off the ground in the back corner of the basement. She said it had absolutely no facial features, but it looked like a normal full-body apparition. It had a head, upper and lower body, legs, and everything a human should have, except no facial features whatsoever. And it just kind of hovered, but it was more like a mist that you could see through. She said when she blinked, it literally vaporized into thin air and vanished. She was so scared, and that's when I heard her scream, 
and then she ran up the stairs. I just looked at her and told her, this is exactly what I was telling you about. I told her that I was so sorry it happened to her, and that if she wanted to go home, that she could, and I would completely understand. She said no, and that she didn't want to leave me alone after the ordeal. So we kind of just toughed out the rest of the night together, and hid in my bedroom with the door shut, and turned the TV off. That night when it was time for bed, we lay down together on my bed, and started to drift off to sleep. Somehow, we both woke up and shut up out of bed at the exact same time. From the both of us hearing a weird noise coming from outside my bedroom window. We both just looked at each other and she said, Did you hear that? I nodded my head. Yeah. And we got up out of bed and walked towards the window. What we both heard sounded like a super creepy growling sound. It sounded totally inhuman. It was completely evil. It was a noise that you could only imagine coming from a warthog and kind of like a lion's roar. I don't even know what words to use that could have described just exactly what we heard, but I pulled my curtain back from the window and we both peered out into the dark night. What we both saw will forever stick with her and I until the day we die. There was a really weird looking stick type figure, thing. That's the best way I can describe what it looked like. It was tall, lanky, all black. The way it walked across the street under the glow of the streetlight was very eerie. It took the biggest steps each time it moved and it was sort of like a cartoonish type movement. Like when a cartoon character tiptoes to sneak up on someone and it takes super wide and totally non-realistic giant steps. That's how this thing was walking across the street. It looked like just a tall, big, thin, squiggly electrical figure. It was by far the craziest thing we ever seen. We hid back in the bed and didn't come out from under the covers until morning. We still to this day have absolutely no idea what the hell we were looking at that night. Her and I are still very much close friends. And when we hang out together and talk about old memories, if that house is brought up in conversation, we always remember that creature-like thing we saw walking into the cemetery that one night. And even though we can joke, and laugh about it now. It still gives us the chills just thinking back to that terrifying night. We experienced all of that together. Now that we're much older, we've actually sat down and tried to debunk what we've seen. And we've tried so hard to make sense of it. And we just can't. No matter what we try to trick ourselves we could have seen, we both know exactly what it was and what it was not. Living in that house for the entire year and a half that I did was absolute hell for me. I have been scratched, pushed, had my hair pulled, I woke up in the middle of the night with a burning sensation on my leg, and when I pulled the blanket back to see what was hurting, I could clearly see a bite mark on my ankle. And it wasn't a normal bite mark pattern either. Whatever actually physically bit me very hard and sharp with jagged teeth. The indentations in my skin were just tiny little dots in the shape of a pattern of teeth, like an actual bite mark. So, to even try imagining the things my friend saw in the basement, but with super sharp and pointy teeth, absolutely terrifies me to the core. We moved out of that house after living there for a year and a half. There was one evening, it was a Sunday dinner, and we were having it at my grandparents' house. And somehow, that house got brought up in conversation over the dinner table. And I asked my mum if she remembers the day I called her and asked her about the voice I heard coming from the basement, that it sounded just like her voice calling my name. And she immediately went so pale in the face. 
I asked her what was wrong, and she said, Yeah, I do remember that, and I'm sorry for telling you I didn't believe you all those times. I asked her what exactly she meant, and she told me that one day she was sitting at the dinner room table, at the computer, and she heard exactly what sounded like her father's voice calling her from the basement. She said she heard his voice very distinct and raspy yell, Stacy, from down there, while she was all alone in the house one day. She never told me about it when we lived there, and she continued to tell me all about her own personal experiences she had in that house. It made me so mad, because everyone in that house literally made me feel like I was going crazy because I thought I was the only one experiencing the shit happening in that house. But my mum was having the exact same stuff happen to her. She just never told me, because she didn't want to scare me any more than I already had been. So she just left it alone, and never told anyone about it, until years later. I'm now 21, and I still think about this house from time to time. This is the most I've thought about it in a very long time now. And it's almost like every time I bring it up, I get such an off feeling. I don't know how to describe it, but I hate talking about that place. I never had anything paranormal happen to me before moving into that house. I experienced a whole new level of belief after living in that portal to hell. I still drive by it from time to time, and every time I do, it's almost always put back up for rent. People don't stay there any longer than three to six months. This takes place around Christmas time when I was 13 years old. Do the math, and that was around 2008. My aunt always had a way of going all out for Christmas with countless decorations, lights, and little Christmas trees. Her crowning achievement, though, was the eight-foot tree in her sunroom outside. Each year, she decorated with over 300 ornaments and what seemed like miles of light. The best part was that it rotated in the tree stand. Her house was really something around that time of year. It's important that I tell you this because I need you to understand how important this was to her. My brother and I, mostly me if we're being honest, had told her we would help her decorate that year. Neither of us had any idea what we were getting ourselves into. Over the next few days I was wrapping things in garland, untangling lights, and getting things from the attic. This all took place between 8 or 9 in the morning to about 8 that night. So, yeah, a full work day. Once the day was over, I'd head home, which was within shouting distance, eat a late dinner, and attempt to go to bed. I'd say attempt, because for whatever reason, my body wasn't having it. I continually drifted in and out of sleep, never really reaching that deep slumber you need to rest. I would end up staying up until 5 or 6 in the morning before finally falling out from pure exhaustion, I'm sure. This left me with about 2 to 3 hours of sleep before heading back over there and helping my aunt all day. Over those 3 days, I got maybe 8 hours of sleep. On the night of the third day, though, my body had enough. We were finished decorating, so I headed home, skipped dinner, and went straight to bed. I didn't turn on the TV, listen to music, nothing. I just went to bed. Before I knew it, I was asleep. I woke up some 12 hours later the next day. Now when I say that, I don't mean I got up, stretched, and was ready to greet the morning. I mean my body woke up. I was still in bed, not really ready to face the day, so I continued laying there. Soon after, I felt something crawl over my legs at the foot of my bed. I didn't think anything of it because our cat Gizmo loved sleeping on my dirty clothes and my closet was right at the foot of my bed. 
If I weren't half asleep, my body would have recognized that it wasn't our cat Gizmo. Cats don't weigh that much. Looking back, I can only equate the feeling to someone stepping over you while you're in a sleeping bag, camping. Like I felt the blankets compress around my leg near where the steps were. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, soon after this, I felt something grabbing on my right ankle. Keep in mind, I was lying on my stomach. It wasn't a hard grab. It was actually pretty gentle, but soon it began pulling me back. Somehow my sleeping brain didn't register just how insane this whole situation was, so I just shook my foot and the feeling dissipated. Only seconds later though, it started on my other ankle. Again, a soft grab and then a tongue. My foot started lifting from the bed before again I just shook it away. Finally, I felt both of my ankles getting grabbed and the pulling began. It was a bit harder this time, but for some reason, I allowed it to go on much longer. Writing this out still gives me goosebumps to this day. My entire body began slowly moving down the bed. I know it sounds insane, but I could feel my shirt rolling up underneath me as I was being pulled closer to my closet. Finally, something in my rational mind clicked and I jolted awake and scurried to the back wall where the head of my bed was with my knees pulled to my chest. I can still remember what I saw to this day. It was an all-white face with deep black eyes that resembled an abyss. Its mouth hung open and it too was black as tar. It looked angry. I find it so strange that something that had no pupils could express such emotion, but I remember it looking straight at me and letting out an otherworldly scream. It was deep and rumbly while being breathy and high-pitched at the same time. It's incredibly hard to describe. I'm not afraid to admit that I screamed. Not only did I scream, I screamed for my mom. I had no idea what she would do, but at that moment, it was all I could muster. The face vanished soon after that, and I left the room. When I eventually returned, I remember looking around the doorway and into the closet to make sure it wasn't in there. Luckily, it never was. As I've grown up, I learned about sleep paralysis and thought for a while this could have been what I experienced, but I'm not sure. I was able to shake it off of me and I've had a handful of sleep paralysis episodes later in life that were nothing like this. I'm not sure what was on the land before my uncle bought it, but I feel like there may have been something residing there. Maybe not necessarily evil, but very angry. My first experience with sleep paralysis wasn't as eventful as others. I know some people have talked about seeing things in their room, something on their chest, or even being touched, but that didn't happen to me. Mine was fairly mild. I was about 14 or 15 years old and had fallen asleep in my room watching something on television. Most likely Ghost Hunters. Some hours later, I woke up, but I didn't wake up. I'm sure anyone who's dealt with SP before knows what I mean. I could feel the blanket over me, hear the low voices on the TV, and tell I was in a very uncomfortable position. When I tried to move, I couldn't. My heart immediately started racing. In my young brain, I convinced myself I had managed to somehow paralyze myself. Completely irrational, I know, but I was fairly young. I laid there for most likely only a minute or so before finally breaking out of it and waking up completely. For some reason, I wasn't as scared as I thought I should have been. I mean, not being able to move or break from restraints is one of my biggest fears, but for whatever reason, it didn't really get to me. I started googling not being able to move while awake, and that's when I learned what SP was. And that was it for a few years. 
I didn't have a second episode until I was in my 20s and living with my wife in an apartment in Greensboro. We moved there after graduating to go to college. I ended up dropping out, but that's beside the point. She was working as a babysitter, and I was working third shift at a Harris Teeter. I had the following night off, so I was at home working on stuff for my YouTube channel. Around 3 p.m. or so, I was feeling a little drained, so I decided on taking a nap until she got home around 5.45 or 6 p.m. I left my little closet studio and went to lay down in bed. Real quick, I need to explain the layout a bit. We had three large windows on one side of our bedroom. The side I slept on faced these windows, and the bed itself was only a few feet from them. Behind me was the rest of the bedroom and a small hallway leading into our bathroom. Now, I'd fallen asleep rather quickly, but I am a light sleeper, so when I woke up to the sound of footsteps behind me, I assumed it was my wife getting home from work. I can't really explain how I heard these footsteps because the bedroom was all carpet, but somehow I could hear the footsteps pressing down on it. I went to turn around and greet her, but I couldn't move. Great, I thought, this shit again. No worries, she'll come over and wake me up and all will be okay in the world. That didn't happen. The footsteps just continued, but never seemed to get any closer. They were always just near the edge of the bed. This went on for what felt like an hour, but eventually my eyes opened and I quickly rolled over to see what was behind me. There was nothing there. Hoping my wife had just made her way out of the room, I headed out and went to the living room, but... I was alone in the house. As a matter of fact, when I eventually checked my phone, my wife had texted me saying she was going to be late getting home. So, that would mean she hadn't come home and then left. And that's what I heard. She... she was never there. I never had another experience quite like that one, but I have had a few more sleep paralysis episodes. None have ever come close to that experience, however. 99% of the time, it's just the feeling of something in the room with me. This story isn't necessarily scary, but just weird. I've never been able to come across a rational conclusion to the whole thing. It happened at my aunt's house sometime in the fall or early winter. My uncle would go deer hunting around this time, and my aunt, who was in her 50s at the time and had really bad nerve problems, wanted someone to stay with her. We lived on my uncle's land, so it wasn't more than a three-minute walk from my yard to hers. I was maybe four or five years old and had my own room over there, so I volunteered. On top of this, we always had a great time together. I'd say it was the third or fourth day there that it happened. I was in bed playing with my Game Boy Advance, staying up much later than I should have been. I can't say for sure what time it was, but it had to have been after midnight. As I was laying there, I heard the silverware drawer in the kitchen slowly slide open. At first, I thought it was just my aunt getting a late snack, so I hid the Game Boy under my pillow and acted like I was asleep. But then I heard something much more jarring. Go into your kitchen, take out your silverware drawer, and shake it as hard as you can. Now, imagine that sound in the middle of the night at five years old. I was frozen in fear. I sat there for a minute, waiting for my aunt to walk by, waiting for anything, but I didn't see anything. I only heard the sound of my aunt snoring. She was fast asleep. She'd not gone into the kitchen. I mustered up my courage and headed out into the hallway to turn on the kitchen light. 
As I turned the corner from the hallway into the kitchen, I didn't see her or anyone for that matter. It was reassuring and also terrifying in a way. I knew we were the only two in the house, so at least no one had broken in. I walked over to the drawer and slid it open, only to find that everything was in place. Nothing was even crooked. I ran back to my room and hid under the covers before I finally fell back to sleep. I never told her about it, and I only told my parents years afterward. I'm not sure what it was, but I've always thought there was something in her house. There were many nights, even when I was a teenager, that I would see some sort of black mass creeping beside my doorway out the corner of my eye. It could have been nothing, but then again, who knows. People like happy. They respond to happy. Sad is a different story. One that's far shorter with fewer characters and less descriptors. Sad is in the thin leaflet you hide behind the brighter covers. No one really wants to know it's there. Not even you. Sad is uncomfortable. And so, I was happy. I had my work acquaintances, the kind you make small talk with while wishing you could be anywhere else. I had a few people I played video games with once or twice a week. I had a cat. Beyond that, my social circle was non-existent. My only real friend was Harper, and in the back of my mind, I sometimes wondered if she only stuck around because she was my sister. I never asked. I was too worried about what her answer might have been. I also didn't want to ruin the illusion. Smile, laugh, chit-chat about the fluffy stuff. Keep it light, and maybe you'll start to feel a little less dark. That's what I told myself, anyway. If anyone realized that it was a front a good portion of the time, almost nobody said anything. Like I said, sad is uncomfortable. Harper and I talked a few times a week. Sometimes on video calls, but mostly just over voice chat. She'd tell me about her job, some fancy-sounding science gig that I'd never quite understood. I'd tell her about mine, editing local opinion pieces about how people who lived near an airport, which had existed before their neighborhood had been built, hated the airport. We'd swap video game stories, updates about friends, her art, my attempts at writing. She was one of the few people that could make me laugh, really genuinely laugh. But sometimes after I was finished, she'd go quiet for a moment and then ask the question I hated most. So, you're okay, right, Sky? My go-to was to scoff and reply, Of course, why do you ask? She never had a good reason, just that I sounded off. I'd brush her off with an excuse of being tired and end the call. I wasn't about to burden the one person who actually made me feel less alone. I used to, turning on her and spilling my guts whenever I started to feel down. Now, between her career and being a newlywed, she had enough going on in her life without me adding to it. And I had my cat Bjorn, and bottles of wine. What more could a girl ask for? I was at a low point when it started. Dark thoughts, dark apartment, dishes and laundry piling up. The only thing I really cared about was making sure Bjorn was still looked after. Giving him fresh food and water was what got me out of bed. His playful mules and need for attention kept me out of it. We'd sit together on the couch watching reruns of whatever was on while I nursed glass after glass of Moscato. I just drained my latest cup and was already hearing the sirens call for more. Bjorn rumbled happily when I moved him from my lap and got up to head to the kitchen. I tugged open the fridge door and started to reach for the wine. Something within the pale liquid moved. I froze, my fingers around the neck of the bottle, and squinted. I was, admittedly, already a bit tipsy, and thought for a moment that it had just been a trick of the lights. Until the wine sloshed again and a dark shape zipped upward from behind the label. 
Slowly, I lifted the bottle from its spot on the shelf, suddenly queasy with the thought that I'd been drinking glorified cockroach bath water. A cockroach would have been preferable to what was actually swimming around in my wine. Whatever it was, exactly. The creature, no bigger than my palm, had long, spindly tentacles that were caught somewhere between octopus and jellyfish. As it propelled itself around, little chunks of its flesh, which was modded with decay, were left floating in its wake. I gagged and extended my arm to hold the wine and its inhabitant away from my face. The sharp movement upset the thing and it launched itself at the side of the bottle toward me. It spread its tentacles against the glass and pressed its underside to it, revealing an all-too-human mouth that snapped and gashed its brown teeth. I shrieked and instinctively tossed the bottle away from me. It hit the floor and shattered. Shards of glass and wine spread across the linoleum, and I skittered backward, frantically searching for the monster, but it was nowhere to be seen. After locking Bjorn in my room, where he couldn't get near the mess, I returned to the kitchen with a broom, and held in both fists, raised and ready to smash whatever had come out of the bottle. Just like before, though, all I found was wine and broken glass. I cleaned the spot where it had fallen until my apartment stank of bleach and then looked through every cupboard and drawer I had. I crawled on my hands and knees with a flashlight to peer under tables and chairs. I never found the little octo monster. I took solace in another bottle of wine after thoroughly checking it out before I opened it until I didn't have to think about it anymore. When I woke up with a nasty hangover the next day, it seemed pretty clear that I'd overdone the drinking, and my experience had been a result of my overindulgence. Embarrassing, to say the least, and waste of perfectly good wine. It was also a reminder of how bleak things were starting to seem. I'd become that woman who keeps her cat in the room so she can say she isn't drinking alone. Instead of being the wake-up call I might have needed, it just made me feel worse. I was failing. I didn't even know at what exactly, just that I was. I skipped the call with Harper that night. When she followed up with a text to see if I was okay, I told her I wasn't feeling well and I'd gone to bed early. It wasn't a lie. I was already buried beneath my covers. All the lights in my bedroom switched off. As soon as I hit send, I placed the phone face down on the nightstand and rolled over to stare at the wall. I drifted in and out of sleep, I guess, but while I was awake, I wondered how long I could stay there before anyone noticed. A day? A week? Would anyone but my sister even care? I didn't feel like I would, so why should they? A tight, heavy feeling crept into my chest. An oppressive ache that made me want to cry and scream, but at the same time made it too hard to do so. I flipped onto my back and inhaled a shaky breath to try and chase it away. The shuddering sigh echoed from under my bed. I sat upright, covers clutched to my chest. The sigh had turned to breathing, deep and ragged, and something dragged across the floorboard. It sounded like Bjorn's claws, but heavier much heavier. The breathing was getting louder and my king-size bed frame jumped slightly. The dragging sound was moving, I realized, through the white fog of fear in my head. It was slowly going from directly beneath me, off to one side. And the closer it got to the edge, the quicker and more eager it was becoming. Out in the hall, Bjorn meowed pitifully. His cries sent me reeling out of bed. I jumped as far as I could, hit the wall, and tumbled out into the hall where Bjorn was waiting. I slammed the door shut behind me and scooped up the cat before running into the living room where I quickly realized I left my phone on the nightstand. With no landline, I had no way to call for help without leaving the apartment and knocking on the neighbor's doors. The more I thought about it though, the crazier it sounded. How could I explain that there was a monster under my bed without coming off as delusional? There was no way. And I couldn't put any of this on Harper. Not again. I fell onto my couch and held Bjorn, who nuzzled me while I cried into his fur. 
What was happening to me? Of course, when I finally returned to my room with a kitchen knife, it was empty. Isolation is a funny thing. It feels freeing and cold all at once. I stopped going to work. Didn't even call in. Couldn't bring myself to. I also didn't answer Harper beyond a couple of texts telling her I needed some time to myself and not to worry. She still tried to call, and every few hours, my phone would ding with new messages or pictures she thought would make me laugh. I put my phone on silent and left it in a drawer. I spent the next three days in my apartment, hardly moving or eating. I didn't speak to anyone except Bjorn. I kept thinking it was time for me to answer my sister, but I just couldn't muster the energy to do so. My phone seemed too far away, and the words I would need were farther still. Being alone was easier. The only reason I could bring myself to leave was Bjorn. He was almost out of litter, and even in my current state, there was no justification good enough to let him suffer even the slightest bit. I tied my hair into a greasy bun, pulled on the cleanest clothes I could find, and trudged outside. It was already getting dark as I cut across the park and made my way to the nearest big box store. I grabbed a litter and a frozen pizza, paid, and started for home again. In the time it took me to get my things, the sun had gone down completely. I kept to the park this time, where it was the most well lit. It was a little less direct and longer than simply going through the grass, but it felt safer. There was a bridge over a pond in the middle of the park, and during the day, it was quite a pretty spot. At night, it took on a gloomier quality. The draping branches of the weeping willows around it reminded me of the Octo Monster from the wine bottles as their silhouettes moved with the breeze. I swallowed hard, trying to calm the nervous flutter in my stomach, but the closer I got to the bridge, the more uneasy I became. I felt like I was being watched. As I reached the footbridge, a shadow separated from one of the tree trunks. In the dim light, its outline was long and thin, standing almost twice as tall as it was. It carried itself slowly on four spider-like limbs that cracked painfully with each movement. The body itself seemed too bloated to be supported by those legs. It was coming towards me, and each step seemed to be agony for it because it kept emitting low, guttural groans. I screamed and started to back up, my bag slipping from my hands as I fumbled for my keys. The thing in the dark kept coming. I yanked my keyring from my pocket and flipped on the smallest flashlight I'd clipped on there. Its frail beam landed on the thing, sweeping over its bone-white fleshed and tangled curtain of hair until it landed on its face. Or rather, my face. A mask of my features pulled into a fake two-wide smile was half hanging over its own flimsy strap. All I could see of its real face was a roving, bloodshot eye. When the light hit it, it hissed and squealed. That was enough for me. I unrooted my feet and tore back through the park all the way to the big box store, screaming the whole time. People typically have two reactions when you're an adult who says they see monsters scorn, or concern for your mental well-being. I got plenty of both, but I tried to recount the last couple of weeks of my life to others, but I just stopped repeating it. No one, not the police or doctors I saw, believed me. Not until I spoke to Harper. I felt awful when I pulled my phone out of its hiding place and dialed her number. She didn't need this, even if I did. It was wrong of me. No one else should have to deal with my sadness. I almost hung up. As I was about to, my sister's voice came on the line, and the relief I heard in it was enough to have me sobbing. After I could speak again, I told her everything. That I wasn't well, and I'd been seeing things. I babbled about the octo-monster, the boogeyman under my bed, the tall spider thing with a mask of... my face... I poured it all out through gasps and tears, and Harper listened with quiet intensity. And then all she said was, Hold on. I waited, 
My stomach nodded with icy certainty that this was going to be it, the thing that finally pushed her over the edge and made her realize how much better she was without me. Instead, she came back a few minutes later and told me to check my emails. There were two waiting for me when I checked. The first had three attachments. I clicked the first one. It opened to a charcoal sketch of a wine bottle. Floating inside of it was a small, octopus jellyfish creature. Confused, I continued to the second. Another drawing. I recognized my own bedroom right away. A pair of claws, long and razor sharp, were just visibly poking out from underneath the bed. I didn't need to open the third one to know what it would be, but I did anyway. The spider thing, wearing my face as a lopsided mask, stared at me from its visible, oversized eye. What are these? I managed to ask. They're your demons, Harper said softly. My sister knew me better than anyone. Even over the phone, she could read me. When I was in a bad place, when I'd been drinking and trying to hide it, when I'd shut myself off from the world, she knew, and she felt useless. She wanted so badly to help, but didn't know how, and I wasn't opening up to her anymore. In her frustration and upset, she turned to her art for release. The little demon that lived in the wine and fed my bad thoughts until they drowned out everything else. The nighttime demon that waited until I was alone and filled my head with doubt and worry. The ever-present demon that lurked behind all my fake smiles and clung to me with long, spindly legs so that I was forced to carry its heavy, suffocating body. The demons she'd seen in me even as I tried to hide them. The second email was a one-way plane ticket for a flight out to her city the next day. Her guest room would be waiting for me and Bjorn. It wouldn't fix things, she told me, but it was a start, and she'd be right there with me to take it one step at a time. We couldn't explain how those demons had gone from her page to my home, and right then, I didn't want to try. I just wanted to hug her for seeing me for who I was and not who I thought I was supposed to be. We'd talked about it many times in the months that followed, but we never came close to understanding what really happened. Eventually, we stopped trying. The how just didn't seem as important anymore. Simply knowing that it had, and the good that came after because of it, was enough for the both of us. I took the picture of Jody Callanthrope. You know the one. It was all over the papers when she went missing. Her pretty blonde ringlets and apple blossom cheeks followed you everywhere you went for the first two years, always hoping she'd turn up. When she was pronounced legally dead, her parents held a memorial service. It was my picture that they used in place of a casket. No dead body to lay to rest, just memories and dead in hopes to fill the empty spaces. Of course, at the time, I didn't know I was taking her very last picture. I was an amateur photographer, and I'd set up shop in the local mall for the day. Just a few lights and some backdrops. It didn't change much, because I was hoping to expand my portfolio and one day become a real professional photographer. I spent the day taking pictures of a few teenage girls, some kids, one or two adventurous mothers. And Jody, of course. I remember her most vividly of all, and not just because of her disappearance shortly afterward. It was because she practically bounced into my arms, all bubbly joy and pink frills. I know most five-year-olds are probably like that, but with Jody it seemed... different. I guess I'm not explaining it well. I've kept my thoughts on this subject to myself. I used to have this horrible feeling that her kidnapper must have felt the same way about her, and that's why he chose her instead of someone else. It doesn't matter. The point is, shooting Jody was a joy. She did everything I told her exactly as I told her to do it. The perfect model. I spent almost an hour with her, and at the end of the session, her mother paid me double my rate just because she loved how happy my pictures made Jody. 
all in all, a successful day for me, which is why I was not expecting the police to come knocking on my door two nights later. Unofficially, I was a person of interest. Being one of the last people Jody interacted with, I guess it makes sense that they'd suspect me. But it didn't take long for the cops to decide I had nothing to do with it. I had a solid alibi for the night of her disappearance, and my DNA wasn't found at the scene. Apparently, there'd been a struggle in her bedroom, and they'd found some DNA that has never been identified. At any rate, they did come and ask questions, and wanted all the pictures I'd taken of Jody, which I was happy to provide. They chose the best of the bunch. A cute picture of her sitting with her crossed legs and a beaming smile to put in all the papers. And the rest, as they say, is history. They credited me with the picture. I thought that was kind of strange, to be honest, but it wasn't all bad. I have to admit, I got a lot of interest after that. Do you know how many people wanted to be photographed by me? And were actually willing to pay? It was like it had become some kind of morbid tourist attraction for people obsessed with mysteries and true crime stories. Sort of left a bad taste in my mouth working with those people, but they paid good money and I figured it wasn't really hurting anybody. Better they come bother me than go after her parents, right? Of course, I got some hate mail from people convinced that I'd murdered her, but those were few and far between. Eventually the fervor around her disappearance died down and I faded into obscurity. My photos got better and I really did become a professional photographer. I made enough money to get by and everything. Once in a while I'd get a question about Jody. What was she like? Did I sense something was off about her? Did I have any idea that something terrible was going to happen? But it became increasingly rare as time went by. This year is the 10 year anniversary of Jody's disappearance. There was a big article in the paper for her. People on the streets were whispering about her. What do you think ever happened to Jody Callanthrope? She was on our collective minds as the most famous mystery to ever come out of our sleepy little suburb. I should have been expecting a resurgence of interest in my photograph. But I wasn't, and it came as a surprise when he came walking into my store. He looked to be in his mid-thirties, with thinning brown hair and pale skin. He was about my height, just under six feet, but he walked with a slouch that made him look smaller. He was wearing these old Coke bottle glasses, and he kept fidgeting with them as he talked. I, I was wondering, are you James Winterstein? As in the James that took that picture of... of Jody? I nodded and gestured for him to sit down in my little waiting room. Hey, that's me, what about it? I could tell he had questions, but didn't seem to know where to start. I waited patiently while he gathered his wits. I was just wondering... How did you manage to do it? A red flag went up in my mind. Did this guy think I kidnapped her? And of course he did. Just my luck. One of those delusional vigilantes had come to my shop to harass me. My voice came out harsher than I intended when I asked, What are you talking about? How did you manage to capture her spirit so well? He asked in a rush, oblivious to my abrupt change in tone. I mean, every time I see that picture of her in the papers, I get goosebumps. It looks like I could reach out and touch her. But was there some kind of, I, I don't know, technique that you used? A special camera? What was it? I relaxed a little at that. His curiosity seemed genuine enough. I didn't do anything special, I said with a shrug. I just told her how to pose. She brought the life to all those pictures all of her own. He nodded a little, looking wistful. Yeah, that sounds like Jody, all right. You knew her? I asked. 
Yeah, I guess. I mean, I was their next door neighbor for a few years. Jody used to play in my yard. Sweet little kid. Terrible what happened to her. I nodded, and we chit-chatted for a bit after that. Just as he was leaving, he asked, Do you think you could take some pictures of me? If you have the time? Sure, I said. What did you want? If you give me your card, I can email you the details, he said. I gave him a business card and sent him on his way. Didn't think anything of it. Not until that night when I got his email. The subject line was an address. In the body of the email, it simply said, If anyone can bring her to life, it's you. Suddenly, my interaction from earlier in the day didn't seem so innocent. Not one bit. I'm not some kind of shitty B-horror movie, and I'm not stupid, so the first thing I did was call the police. 911, what's your emergency? Hi, uh, my name is James Winterstein, and I got a weird email, and I, I, I know how it sounds, but I think it's connected to the disappearance of Jody Callanthrope. The operator sounded bored as she answered. I'm sure I wasn't the first person to call about Jody. They probably had lots of wackos over the years who thought they'd solved the mystery of Jody's disappearance. Can you tell me what was in the email, sir? Uh, well, it's from a guy who came to my photography studio this morning. I'm the guy that took Jody's picture, you know, the one that runs in the papers, and he came in asking me some questions about it. Just now, he sent me an email with the address and told me that if anyone can bring her to life, it's me. The operator was quiet for a few moments, and I had time to think about how painfully crazy that sounded. What was the address, sir? I repeated it to her. More silence. Sir, where are you now? I'm... At home, why? Please stay where you are. We'll send an officer as soon as we can. Do not leave the house. Lock all doors and windows. What? Why? What's happening? Please remain calm, sir. Give me your address and we'll have someone out to you as soon as we can. I gave her my address and hung up the phone. Frustrated and unsettled. For one fleeting moment, I considered getting into my car and checking out the address anyway, but immediately put it from my mind. I'm not some kind of hero. I knew better than to get involved in whatever the fuck was happening. Two hours later, an officer came by and insisted I come with him down to the police station, where I sat down and was questioned by two other officers for about a half an hour. At the end of it, one of the officers, Officer Elroy, took me aside and finally explained what was happening. Earlier this evening, we received a tip off about Jody. Someone was claiming to have seen her at the address you gave us. The address belongs to a dilapidated cabin down in Wood Rents Grove. When we arrived, we found her. My heart skipped a beat. You found Jody? She's alive? Officer Elroy gave me a sad look, and I felt my heart sink. No, son, she's not. She's been dead at least three days now. We'll have to do a DNA test to confirm the identity of the body, but at this point, we have no reason to believe it's anyone other than Jody Calandro. Shock numbed me to the core. You mean this whole time she's... She's been here, in town, all these years. He sighed. Most likely. It's more common than you might think. The man you saw earlier this evening, we think he's connected to her death and her kidnapping. We're doing everything in our power to find him. If he's in contact with you again, we need you to contact us immediately. He wasn't there at the scene? He shook his head. The numbness left me, and anger boiled in my chest. I want to see her, I said. 
He opened his mouth, probably to refuse me, but I insisted. I was one of the last people to see her alive. I just... I just want to see her. Please. Eventually, he shut his mouth and nodded. I followed him to the morgue. Before her parents had seen her or even informed of her likely discovery, they pulled down the sheet and I looked into the face of a girl I would recognize anywhere, even after all these years. I could see where her rosy cheeks had faded, her charming smile had thinned into a permanent frown. Her liveliness had drained into endless exhaustion. It was Jody, but... Then again, it wasn't. I stared at her for at least ten minutes, and then I turned around and left. The next few weeks were a shit show. Jody's parents were devastated, the town was in shock, my phone was ringing off the hook, more obsessive freaks wanting to ask questions about Jody's picture. I ignored my phone, closed down the shop, and sat in my room. I drank, mostly, and tried to forget about the world, just to get away from it all for a little while. I did talk with Jody's mother a little. She'd kept in sporadic contact with me since Jody's disappearance, and though it sometimes made me uncomfortable, I couldn't find a way to shut her out. I always sort of felt like I owed it to her to be there for her, even though it wasn't my fault and there's no way I could have prevented it. She asked me to come to the funeral, the real funeral. I kept thinking of a polite way to decline, knowing I wouldn't be able to, knowing I'd end up suffering through it. The cops checked up on me once or twice, kept tabs on me to make sure that her kidnapper hadn't tried to contact me again. He didn't, of course. Not dumb enough, I guess. I went to the funeral... I cried for a little girl I never knew. I took some more time off work, but eventually opened shop once more. Jody's parents sold their house and moved a few towns over. Can't say I blame them. What would you say if it happened to you? Life went back to normal. At least as normal as it can ever be after something like that. But normal became a thing of the past this morning. Because this morning, I opened my email like always. I skimmed the subject lines until I focused on the one I had been sent in the late last night and paused. Written there in black and white. It's my very worst nightmare. I'm still waiting for those pictures.